now. So thank you so much, Mr. Federico, for joining in. And it's my pleasure to introduce our guest lecturer for this session, Mr. Federico, who is the CEO and co-founder of Cleros. Cleros is pioneer in terms of blockchain arbitration. And the reason why we actually wanted to have this session with Cleros is because in India, we have some of these startups which are working in the online dispute resolution. But the world is moving fast and India is also catching up with the online dispute resolution. So what's the next thing? So the next big thing is blockchain arbitration and we wanted to explore and get insights from the expert of blockchain arbitration, Mr. Federico. So thank you so much, Federico, for accepting our invitation and taking out time from your busy schedule. We welcome you. Thank you. Thank you, Akash. Um, so the way we restructured that is that we will just have a short introduction uh, by me, but promise it won't be long, uh, five minutes on uh, the framework around blockchain arbitration. And then uh, Dr. Federico as will uh, present uh, to you uh, the concept of Kleros, which is by now the most developed concept of uh, blockchain arbitration. Um, and as Akash explained, the reason why we really want to teach that in India is because India is a very fast growing country, uh, especially in the field of the telecoms. Uh, and young lawyers, you really need, will need to become familiar with online disputes, especially since the COVID-19 revolution, uh, but more importantly with the blockchain technology that is uh, going to be very um, important uh, in India. So I will try to share my short slides. I hope it's it's visible. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Great. So four things. Uh, on, when I'm changing the slide, uh, it's it's visible as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So four things to have in mind uh, when uh, trying to approach blockchain arbitration. Uh, it's the four main points I develop here. Uh, it's the issues related to smart contract litigation and why litigation can't work with smart contracts. Uh, we will then briefly present the features of blockchain arbitration, uh, even though this will be mainly uh, achieved by um, Federico. Then we will study briefly the international arbitration framework. Um, is it compatible or not with blockchain arbitration? Uh, and then I will suggest this new approach towards arbitration uh, which uh, Kleros is already using, which is the concept of decentralized justice, and more uh, specifically the concept of decentralized arbitration, where we would have a form of sui generis form of arbitration, which doesn't need to rely on the existing uh, arbitration framework. Uh, so starting with smart contract litigation issues, I have listed a few issues that you need to have in mind to understand why litigation can't work for smart contracts. And I think the most problem pro problematic uh, issue is the fact that we have now with the blockchain a decentralized economy. So all these concepts of the law about conflict of law, conflict of jurisdiction, which usually rely on the place of business, the place of performance of the contract, this cannot work on the blockchain. Um, especially conflict of law methods that rely on the place of the defendant. Uh, on the blockchain, you contract with a crypto wallet. And in most of the cases, you don't know the identity of who is contracting with you uh, on the blockchain, you have the number of, of the wallet, but that's it. Uh, in many countries, the validity of smart contract is still highly debated. Uh, so if you go to national courts, there is a big possibility that they will just say your contract is it's just a code, it's a program, we don't know that, it's not valid. Time and cost, blockchain uh, aims at uh, being a fast way to uh, have transaction and at, at cheaper cost. If you start litigation, which costs usually thousands of dollars, uh, this doesn't work on the blockchain. Um, the expertise, um, of course, the uh, national judges uh, won't have the required expertise for blockchain disputes. Uh, they don't know what is an oracle. They don't know how to uh, understand coding errors, um, other things they won't be familiar with. And then material enforcement. Even if you get a piece of paper from a court, how do you want to modify a smart contract on the blockchain? Uh, because it's immutable, it's a code. So unless the national court has the power to introduce the decision inside the contract, uh, this will not work. So blockchain arbitration has a few uh, features that uh, Dr. Federico asked will explain that in more details. Uh, it's based on the Oracle because the smart contract has a small window, which is the Oracle. Uh, it allows the blockchain platform to introduce its decision inside the code. And this will trigger the smart contract uh, in one sense or in the other sense. So this allows automatic enforcement. So all the concept of uh, the need of an executor uh, and there's a new convention is removed by these self-enforcement possibilities under the blockchain arbitration. 
It's based on a voting decision making process. So there is no need to draft an award to reason it. Uh, it's, it's a vote. And I think uh, Federico as will, uh, as will explain you more how uh, the scaling point works uh, with Kleros. Um, it's based usually on amiable compositor. So many blockchain arbitration platforms don't um, refer to the law to adjudicate the claim, but rather to equity. Uh, they will assess the evidence and see uh, which party should win or should lose, uh, but they will not refer to uh, you know, principles of contract law and so on. Uh, and finally, it's based on game theory. And again, this I will leave it for Federico Ast. Regarding the compatibility with the international arbitration framework, um, there are a few issues for that. So um, some arbitration uh, platforms, they assert that they are compatible with the international arbitration framework. Uh, for some aspects, yes, but for some other aspects, there will be issues. Uh, for example, the seat of arbitration, usually blockchain arbitration platforms don't refer to a seat of arbitration. And the New York Convention uh, requires the award to be made in the territory of a state. So some platforms do refer to a seat, but some others uh, do not. The decision-making process might also be an issue. The fact that the jurors don't refer to the law, the fact that there is an economic incentive in the decision-making process might be an issue for the enforcement. Um, the fact that the arbitration agreement is made under the cryptographic form, uh, you know, software uh, coders understand that, but people like you and me, uh, we can't read a smart contract. And if there is an arbitration agreement uh, in it, we uh, can't be uh, deemed to have agreed to, that, to this agreement. So this could actually be an issue. Uh, and finally, the cryptographic form of the award. Um, so you, depends on the platform again, but you will uh, not always get a paper with a signature of the jurors uh, that will be the award. It will be only uh, a code that will be introduced in your smart contract. Um, so there is no way you can get the executor on the code. Um, so finally, I just invite you when um, Federico asked, will explain you the clearest concept, try to think with this new sui generis form of arbitration, this new approach. So there exists a few existing approaches toward arbitration. Um, it's called uh, Legal Philosophy of Arbitration. There is one book from Emmanuel Gaillard uh, that explains that. Uh, so back in the time we had the Mondolocola approach, approach where we used to base uh, the legitimacy of the award on the seat. Everything is based on the seat. Uh, the multilocal approach um, allows for a more independent uh, conception of arbitration where we don't specifically look at the jurisdiction of the seat, but at all the potential jurisdiction where the award might be enforced. So if there is a public policy rule uh, in the seat, it's not that important. We might uh, prefer following the law of the place of enforcement rather than the law of the seat. And then there is the transnational approach, which is mainly adopted by French courts and sometimes uh, by US courts, which is the fact that we don't give any uh, deference to national laws. Uh, we only will uh, conduct arbitration according to transnational principles. And now there is blockchain arbitration. And this might give a rise to a new approach toward arbitration, because as I explained to you, some uh, of the principles of the international arbitration framework uh, don't fit with blockchain arbitration. But because blockchain arbitration is self-enforced, it has the capability to create a new legal order, the blockchain legal order. And with this new approach, we will uh, be able to see and to conceptualize uh, this new form of arbitration with no need to rely on any of the existing laws. Uh, and I believe that these laws will be uh, mainly shaped by uh, the blockchain users, but more importantly, uh, by um, people like Federico As, who actually are now uh, trying to, um, to, to give us a framework for blockchain arbitration. Um, and before I finish my presentation, I just want to highlight, for example, one important, um, one important aspect of Kleros. I have noticed that uh, a few days ago, uh, we can see that now on the blockchain, they try to um, create a framework. For example, if you go on, on the Kleros general court, it's recorded that the jurors don't adjudicate a claim if it's uh, pertaining to, you know, to any uh, criminal, criminal offense if it's uh, about corruption, if it's about, I don't know, sexual um, harassment, whatever. And this is me a first stone, a first stone because Kleros is actually now trying to implement public policy on the blockchain and that's uh, a big first step. Uh, so I uh, will now give the floor to Federico As, who will give you more details about the Kleros concept. Thank you very much. Good. Well, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and the kind words, uh, Maxim. Um, let me uh, share my screen. Can you see my screen now? 
Yep. Good. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to start with a little introduction to blockchain as maybe not everyone here uh, is very familiar. So you can all be on the same page. Um, and so for, as you know, you know, blockchain was born in 2008 with this, um, in the middle of this big financial crisis. And then when all of the banks were like falling because of the subprime mortgage crisis, and there was some guy, group of guys, woman or who knows, who under the name of Satoshi Nakamoto published a paper where he or she proposed um, uh, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, which is based on a technology, on a ledger database technology called blockchain. Um, people try to explain this um, in a very hard way with cryptographic concepts and mining and all that, but I prefer to explain blockchain, especially to non-technical people with a little travel into um, island which is in the Micronesia in between Polynesia and Australia you know near Fiji you have this island called the Yap Island where there is a tribe um, called the Yaps and the Yaps have you know this stone called Ray Stone it's their currency you know as we have um, paper or coins and that they have a stone currency with a hole in the middle which looks like a donut um, why did they put that hole in the, in the currency well because they need to transport it from one place to the other. It's easier to put a stick in the middle and have your friends help you. So your friends might help you transport your stone for making payments once, twice, but if you keep asking them you know, for help, they will start by charging you because they, well, they, they don't have time to just work for you all the time. So what the app decided is, okay, let, instead of having to move the rocks from one place to the other, why don't we just leave them in one place and we remember who is the owner of each one, right? So this was a good solution, but then they had another problem. So how do you know who owns which, each of the stones? So one alternative they evaluated was, okay, let's maybe uh, designate one member of the tribe who is going to remember who is the owner of, of this stone uh, but, you know, then they decided not to move forward with this one because what if the, this guy, you know, uh, dies or what if he just forgets or what if he like, uh, you know, uh, he gets bribed or what if um, he starts, you know, making, uh, you know, ch charging people like 10% of his transaction and if they don't pay him, he's not going to tell you who the owner of the stone is, right? So since the YAP didn't want to run this risk, they decided to build their monetary system based on a decentralized database where each member of the tribe had the obligation to know who was the owner of each stone since the beginning of the of the, do of the days where the stone was first uh, carved and uh, produced until the present day. They each had to remember who had been the owner at, along all of the uh, transactions that did this stone went through, right? So uh, let's say Alice now wants to make a payment to Bob because of some service he provided for her. So they gather the tribe and they and she announces, okay, the stone that is like under the palm tree on the beach now is going to go from Alice to Bob and then everyone can see this and then they update their mental ledger and now they know that the stone doesn't belong to her anymore and it belongs to Bob, right? And if she wanted to uh, send this rock to another uh, member of the tribe, they will all they will just say, "Yeah, you can't do this because you already transferred the stone and it doesn't belong to you anymore." Right? So, if you just replace, you know, these little brains of the um, YAP members by computers and you replace the um, stone by uh, digital asset called Bitcoin or, or crypto asset, cryptocurrency in general, then that's the general logic of a blockchain. You know, it's a ledger, which is uh, shared by a number of computers in one network and no one is the owner. So it belongs to all of them. And they all, each of these nodes has a same copy of the same ledger as everyone else, right? And if someone wants to make a payment in from crypto from one place to another, so they just announced with the secret key they have, okay, they're going to make a payment from uh, this account to that account. And then all of the other computers in the, in the network, they just can see that uh, this is going to be done. And so they update their mental or their computer ledger 
to the new state of the of the ledger right so first thing to remember is that blockchain is a distributed shared and very secure database uh, how secure well um, the bitcoin blockchain uh, was never hacked people are trying all the time because there's a lot of money to be made but never was hacked and hopefully it will stay that way uh, and it's also built in very advanced cryptography so we have lots of confidence that this that is going to stand all of the potential attacks that people may want to do um, why should we care about blockchains well on the one hand because um, it's uh, very good for making cheap payments especially between different countries so you have to pay uh, service from well uh, Argentina to, the, to India or to Philippines or whatever and it's very cheap to do that on the Bitcoin while it's very expensive to do it on the traditional you know banking system with all the Swift code and all that right so one thing why people are interested in blockchain and Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general is because of financial applications but this is not why we are here today so we are here because we care about legal applications um, so a very interesting concept built on blockchain is the concept of smart contracts. So this comes from the 1990s when a legal scholar called Nick Sabo, he publishes a paper uh, where he proposes the concept of smart contract. And in that paper, he has this fundamental insight. He says, look, the world economy is moving from analog economy to like a real time digital e-commerce driven economy and still our technology for making agreements, you know, uh, the contract, the paper contract, it's still based on very old technology, you know, technology basically from the 16th century, you know, 15th and 16th century when Gutenberg invented the printing press, you know, that's how the technology of agreements we have today, right? And this is obviously a mismatch with the new economy that is starting to grow um, now. So smart contracts are this concept that will create a new type of technology of agreement for the new digital age that is coming in the world of, of commerce. And the example he uses is um, Alice, she owns a car and she wants to sell this car to Bob and they make a smart contract where they agree that Bob is going to pay uh, X amount of, you know, one amount of crypto asset into an account that they both agree. And so Bob takes the car and he goes to, with his wife to, you know, the road and to visit different places in India and then one day he stops paying uh, and then the car stops working because his car key just stopped working is disabled because of lack of payment and then uh, the car stops working and Alice goes and picks up the car uh, you know uh, because her key just got uh, enabled again because uh, now uh, she, she recovers the car so imagine uh, Bob wanted to, or Alice wanted to recover her car through the traditional, you know, legal system. What what should happen? You know, she had to go to a lawyer. She has to prove that she owns the car because she has a property title on the car. Then she has to prove that she has a contract with Bob by which she sells the car to Bob in exchange to some payment. And then she has to prove that Bob didn't pay for, you know, she didn't comply with the car, with the contract. So she can't, she's, and after proving all that, she can, have the court send a policeman uh, to take the car from Bob and then she can have how much would this cost to her well I guess you know the cost of like two or three cars maybe because of all the legal fees and all the judge fees and all the time she has to spend uh, doing this so the smart contract think that it just uh, does this enforcement you know automatically as the uh, situation so as the payment is not done under the conditions that were set in the contract then this automatically triggers uh, the disabling of uh, Bob's key and the enabling of her key again. And this, you know, results in an enforcement of the situation at a near zero cost, right? So for a lot of time, uh, the ideas of smart contract presented by Nick Sabo were uh, abstract idea and theoric, theoretical idea until, you know, in 2014, this guy called Vitaly Buterin, he, who must be like 24, 25 now, he develops this um, blockchain called Ethereum, which is in many ways uh, similar to the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, in the sense, it's a network of computers that share uh, a ledger. But the, the difference, the main difference is that the Ethereum blockchain can it's, it's has a better programming language, which is more uh, keen for making 
smart contract, right? For coding different types of agreements in it and then these agreements being executed uh, as they are uh, uh, agreed, right? So basically, almost anything that you could put into a format of if X, then Y, then you could, in principle, put this uh, as a smart contract into a blockchain and then have this executed. So like, if the airplane leaves, uh, takes off like uh, with a delay of more than 30 minutes, you know, the passenger is going to be reimbursed uh, like 25% of the cost of the ticket, for example, right? So. No need for the passenger to go to the airlines to make a claim, no need to go to a court, whatever, you know. If this condition happens, then the reimbursement is done in an automatic way and the contract is enforced automatically, right? So how, how cool is this compared to, to other traditional, you know, means of, of enforcement agreements, right? You could have like lots of different use cases. I'm not going to get into them because probably you know some of them and you know, there are lots of information. So, but just one more because I, I like to use this one because it, it makes lawyers angry. You know, I could put my, you know, my, um, my will into a smart contract. You know, I have a number of crypto assets. I have two kids and they want, you know, the day I die, I want this asset to be split into my kids. Uh, and I don't want to, for them to have to pay to lawyers or anything, you know, I just put them and, put a smart contract and then when I die, all my assets are just transferred into the addresses that are defined in the contract. And that's how this, you know, uh, succession, the will is executed like at, at near zero cost and almost immediately. So this is another potential application of, of smart contract um, technology. So let's get now into, into Claros, right? Now you had an introduction to blockchain, smart contracts. And so what is this thing of decentralized justice? And this is basically made out of four main pillars. The first one is international arbitration, right? Um, the, the framework of arbitration as we know it uh, now is based on the um, agreement made uh, in the context of the UN in the 1950s where, so the world of business was globalizing after the war and uh, you know there was this need to produce a legal framework where you know business doing uh, companies doing business abroad had some idea or some hope some uh, certainty of like yeah if they had if they have a conflict with some company of, or some government in some other country so uh, you know how could we resolve this you know because if we don't have a, a framework in which this will be resolved then I, we are just not going to invest in other countries and we're not going to trade in other countries, right? Um, so the new convention tried to provide a solution to that era of, you know, where most um, most decisions for investment, international investment were like very big investment, you know, kind of oil platform building into another country or like, you know, very like multi-million dollar trade agreements with like uh, between uh, different companies or companies and governments, you know, so it was meant for an era of big business. It was meant for an era where of corporations running the world, um, you know, and making a deal for millions of dollars. You know, so a, a bit like you know the the context in which this uh, framework was built started to change, especially in the since the 1990s and the 2000s because of the internet. You know, now you have um, lots of people working for. Uh, you know, contracting for as freelancers for customers all over the world. So um, the nature of international, you know, contracting and, and hiring and outsourcing changed a lot. So you you are from India, so you know this better than anyone. So this, this is a new economic reality. Um, also, you have this new um, phenomenon of crowdfunding. Now people from different countries can just uh, invest small amounts of money uh, in projects from different parts of the world and cryptocurrencies are bringing these closer to anyone. You know, it doesn't matter if you are in, in uh, I don't know, Delhi or Buenos Aires or whatever, you know, you just can, if you are on a blockchain, you can just invest in whatever asset is on that blockchain without any barrier imposed by national jurisdictions, right? So we have this new world economy contrasting with this old, arbitration procedure built for an era that was very different, right? So that was the first pillar of decentralized um, justice. Second one is comes from the, the, the industry of online dispute resolution. Now, this industry was born in the 1990s where 
people started to think, okay, let's, we have the internet. Why can't we just do, you know, use the internet for, for solving disputes, you know, why can't we start using the internet for replacing courts or, you know, or for bringing, for bringing court procedures into the, the internet. So, uh, and lots of these developments that were done in this context were um, done by e-commerce platforms. You know, eBay uh, was a very big, you know, um, uh, e-commerce platform. And then they put into place a system for handling claims that was based on crowdsourcing, right? Uh, if you have a conflict between a user A and user B over some, some you know, problem in the platform, you had a panel made of other users uh, taken from, you know, uh, the platform, uh, crowdsourced among the crowd of other users who would solve that problem, right? So that, those were the early days of the use of crowdsourcing into this little solution. And the, the, the godfather of all this was named guy, a guy called uh, Colin Rule, who built the system for resolution in eBay and also in PayPal when eBay bought PayPal. And Colin, uh, he also, uh, after that, he left and then he built a, an ODR company called Moldia. And um, then uh, now he, well, then, then he sold his company to Tiger Technology and now he's with another uh, new company. So I'm, I can tell you a bit more about this, but so he's the kind of the father of the use of ODR, of, of crowdsourcing in ODR processes. So that's the second big pillar. The third big pillar is the use of blockchain, as I already mentioned, starts with um, Bitcoin blockchain a paper in 2008. I'm not going to get into this as we discussed already. And the fourth main pillar is um, a, a science called game theory and a particular subset of uh, the science called mechanism design. It's about how people, you know, how, how you can uh, produce a model that provides a number of incentives for agents to behave in the desired way. Um, this is very used for um, lots of, you know, auction mechanisms, you know, this is how kind of what underlies how uh, Uber works, you know, all this supply and demand marketplace thing. So um, bargaining. So this is a science created in the early times, you know, by these two guys in the 1940s called uh, Oscar Morgerson and John Boyd Newman. Um, these are the fathers of, you know, game theory. Right, so we have these four pillars and let's see how everything comes together in this very simple situation where, you know, Alice, she's a French entrepreneur and she hires Bob, who is from Guatemala to build a software for her, like a website and they make an agreement. And so um, they go into an app called escrow, Teros escrow, and then uh, she puts the money into an escrow account and they both agree if there is a, a dispute in their contract, there's going to be Claros, a court system, Claros is going to arbitrate this. It's a decentralized arbitrator, right? So this is how it works. She puts money into the smart contract and they both agree that if there is a dispute, Claros is going to arbitrate it. In kind of a similar way to when two companies, um, the traditional arbitration world, you know, they make an agreement and they say, okay, if there is a, um, a dispute with this contract, this is going to be resolved in Paris or London or whatever, right? So kind of Claros is in this way, a kind of a, if you want a internet jurisdiction, internet arbitration uh, seat, right? So the dispute happens and Claros is going to select a number of jurors um, in order to analyze the, the evidence and they're going to, uh, these guys are going to see the contract, they're going to see the, the product that was delivered and they're going to each of them independently, they're going to produce a decision, right? Either she wins or he wins. And then uh, this is like for you to see a bit the interface where, where jurors can um, uh, vote in Claros and they, well, this is a bit how it, uh, how it looks. And then uh, let's say in this case, they vote that Alice wins. And so the money that was held into this escrow there is going to be sent back to her. To her. Um, each of the jurors is going to be paid a small arbitration fee and the money for that typically comes from the losing party, right? So the first feature of decentralized justice is uh, blockchain. Why is blockchain important here? Blockchain is important because the fact that Claros is built on blockchain and it's um, 
uh, built in, in particular in the Ethereum blockchain, make sure that no one can tamper with the process, right? No, no one can like tamper with the evidence that is submitted for the process. No one can tamper with the jury selection process. No, the jury is going to be selected exactly in the way it, with, in which it is like uh, stated in the code and no one can change that. Not even the founders of the company, not even no one. Like, uh, you, you have to make a 51% attack on Ethereum in order to try to select the jurors you want. So what is what does this provide to the system? You know, it kind of provides a very important, you know, feature that is very much looked for in um, a distributed solution system, which is um, rule of law, you know, you, predictability. You know, you know that the procedure is going to work exactly as it was intended and that no party can tamper with that. So it's kind of what the law tries to do, you know, in a, in a, in a rule of law state, you know, things uh, work as they are, it's, as, as the law um, mandates them. And no one can discretionarily like, make any changement in anything, right? So this makes sure that there's no corruption in this system as well, right? So this is a very important feature of decentralized justice. And this is what explains that this system needs to be built on blockchain. So you can have the certainty that everything is going to be happening as it was coded into the contract. Good. Now you may have a question. Okay, but how do you select the jurors, right? That is a very interesting question that you may be asking. And let's think of this woman. She's a um, uh, designer from Vietnam and she uh, has a work and a design company and uh, where she designs website. But at the end of the day, when she's at home, she wants to make some extra money and she can make that money by being a juror into the Cleros network, you know, she can be a juror in cases where there is dispute about a website or about design and that. So how does she get to be selected as a juror? So she needs to get a token called PNK, the name comes from Pinaki on this, uh, the, uh, an ancient, uh, the token that they used to use at ancient Athens in order to select the jurors for the popular trials they, they had, you know, they had this concept that citizens had the right to be juror, so you know, you having this PNK, it, it's a digital token that gives you the right to be drawn as a juror in Claros. It's like a lottery ticket, right? And you can have this ticket and you deposit this ticket into uh, one of the courts in Claros. Claros is a system that can handle lots of different types of disputes. Uh, and so when you want to be a juror, you select in which court you want to work. So if, in this case, you are an expert in a, like a website and then you can, take your token, you deposit your token into the court where you want to work. And then you have lots of people who uh, want to be jurors in cases there. So out of all of those who deposited the token into the court, Chaos is going to select, let's say five of, the, of them in order to be actually jurors uh, randomly, they are selected randomly. And so these guys are going to get the right to see the evidence and they're going to get the right to, to vote on the case and they're going to uh, well, help produce justice in, the, in this case, right? Um, well, and you know, the, the magic here is that these guys, they don't need to uh, reveal their identity. They don't need to, even they don't need to prove that they have the right skills to adjudicate the disputes that they're going to adjudicate, right? They, just by having the token, they can just deposit this into the court where they want to work. And then they're going to be selected um, like uh, if they have a token and no one is going to ask them, hey, do you know how to build a website or not? Because uh, so just having the token uh, it gives you the right to be to be drawn. And this is kind of uh, very different from how it works in traditional ODR systems, right? Uh, how do you make sure that the number of people who are anonymous and they don't have to prove that they have the right skills to solve the case? How do you make sure that they don't just like vote randomly on, on this, the case and just, okay, I'm going to vote A, B, A, A, B, and not even look at the evidence and just collect the money and go? Or how do you make sure that they don't bribe? So number of situations that you may think that may happen in a system like this one. So for preventing this from happening, you know, Cleros has, um, is built on what we mentioned before, mechanism design. This guy you see in the screen is Thomas Schelling. He's a game theorist or was game theorist because he died a couple of years ago. And he uh, won the Nobel Prize in economics 2005. And what he 
what his contribution was to, to the field of game theory was a concept called focal points that we now know as shelling points because of, of his name. And it's about how people coordinate with others when they have to reach a similar, a similar um, decision and they cannot communicate or, or they don't trust each other, right? So focal points is about how people coordinate in situations like, like this. And if I ask you, let's say, um, pick one of those numbers, one of those 12 numbers, each of you individually, and you need to pick the same that the majority will pick, but you can't communicate. You just have to like guess which is the number that's going to be picked by the majority of you. And you know, um, most people uh, will tend to pick the 1000, right? And each of every number of these is potentially valid as a, as a point for coordination, as a focal point. But because 1000 looks special, people overwhelmingly tend to pick that one, right? So that is a focal point for this exercise. So if you put a number of jurors, uh, of experts in like websites to evaluate uh, contract and the same the same contract and same product that was delivered, and they are in a situation where each of them individually needs to uh, try to vote like the majority. The only way in which each of them individually can coordinate with the rest is trying to guess what is the right uh, decision about this case. So, but what we call like a true decision about this dispute, right? So this could be Alice or Bob. And they have to evaluate that individually. And um, if, let's say, you are a, a juror and you like just um, self-selected into a court where you don't have the right skills because you have no idea about websites, but you just anyway you just tried your luck there, or if you just vote randomly and not even look at the evidence. So maybe uh, in this case what was going to happen that you may be just by random luck right one or two times. But then if you keep like taking this into the pool where you don't have expertise, at each time that you make a wrong decision, remember the token that you had to deposit to be drawn. So that token stays locked there. And you only recover the token if you vote with the majority. If you vote with the minority, uh, then you lose that token. So at time that you keep playing this game, trying to game the system, then on average, you will start losing money. And then what's going to happen that you're going to run out of tokens and you're going to exit the system. And on the contrary, if you um, uh, have a, make a decision of staking your tokens into the right court where you have the right expertise and you make an honest work of analyzing the evidence and considering the case, uh, then you will sometimes you may be in the minority because well you know uh, this is subjective and you know there are things that are not very clear cut and then you may be honest and still on the wrong side but over time as you do this once and again you are more likely to be on the majority side of the decision and then you are going to recover your token and then you on top of that make an arbitration fee and so that's how you start making money as you produce uh, decisions uh, which solve dispute, right? So two main features after uh, about decentralized justice is one of them is the collective intelligence. You know, this system works by leveraging crowdsourcing uh, and, and juror, from, which, which comes, the inspiration for that comes from Colin Rule early experiments in eBay. And the third, and this is a very specific feature coming from centralized justice is the use of economic incentives. You know, of course, as you've seen, this works very differently to traditional ODR systems because it looks for incentivizing users through financial means in order to produce the expected decisions. Um, and what are what are the use cases where this, this may work? You know, lots of different e-commerce type of arbitration um, claims, you know, uh, Lots of you know insurance for smaller smaller type of claims, insurance uh, for the car insurance or any other type of insurance, which is typically for, for lower claims. Lots of disputes where you have a customer against some uh, you know uh, utilities company, electricity company, you know telecom telephone company, whatever the like small claims like that, and lots of different situations that are more native to the 
future economy you know like uh, you have this for example um esports competition you know and have teams that are like com competing for the, this this tournament and you know someone claims that an, a user like, like was cheating right and so now you have a dispute between a team who says that their team was cheating and the other team saying that, yeah they were not cheating and you know not, you're not going to court you know <laughs> for this and you're not going to international arbitration in paris I guess for resolving this, you know, in this this is a very native, you know, dispute happening in the internet, where the internet is a jurisdiction by nature for this. So you need a resolution system for this, uh, you know, um, a, a, a system that is native to the internet for a claim which is native to the internet. So why why do you think that Cleros is working with this very, if you want, weird system for resolution? Because lots of the claims that will arise in the future of arbitration, you know, these small claims happening across boundaries are very low cost, you know, this is a very small, you know, um, software development contract, this small, you know, esports, even content moderation thing, you know, content moderation situation is kind of, a, you know, a court when, you know, a user says that, hey, my comment didn't violate terms and conditions. Yes, violated terms and conditions. Now you have a dispute and you have a court, a small court, which should decide if the user gets banned from the platform or not. So traditional ODR methods, uh, of course, they work like, a, they are like mini trials on, on Zoom, if you want, you know, over time arbitration, um, arbitration started in the 50s with a process that was trying to be more flexible than courts. That was the point, you know, you go to arbitration because you want, you don't want to go to court. But then over time, the process of arbitration and it became more rigid and because, and it, it started to look more like a court system, you know, a court, international court, basically, uh, with all of the legal provision of courts and all that, which was not the point of arbitration in the early days. The arbitration was a thing that you, 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 want, you wanted because it was fast, it was much cheaper, right? So, Traditional ODR, you know, is kind of a mini mini arbitration on Zoom, where you know it's cheaper, of course, than traditional arbitration. It's obviously cheaper than uh, court, but it's kind of fifty percent cheaper, if you want, right? It's still better than the other thing, uh, but you know, it's still not good enough for the kind of you know the speed of resolution and the um, cost of resolution that you need in a internet setting. You know, people are used already to you have a problem with eBay or with Facebook or with Google and you expect them to answer or with Amazon, or you expect them to answer in like hours. You don't expect them to answer in 90 days and then submit your claim and then wait for the other party to answer for, for like 90 days. No, that's not how it works in the internet, no. So the kind of Claro system is much better suited to what the ethos of business is in the online settings and the way in which Claros achieves this um, this solution is by leveraging a completely different resolution method with completely different set of incentives based on game theory instead of in traditional um, you know uh, arbitration methods right so what is the the, the point that Claros is going to to like cover in the future of, of law and to the solution so you basically have this continuum line that goes from like very simple and very objective claims to very um, complex and very subjective claims. You know, for everything that is simple and very objective, you know, you can just use AI. You know, machine learning tools can you know automate fully automate the process, and you don't need to even pay a juror or anyone. You know, that just automate that and let's forget it. So that's for those type of claims. You know, that's better than Cleros. Cleros is more expensive because you have to pay humans, you have to spend time, right? So that's Cleros is not the best one. But, you know, for other more subjective type of claims, you know, uh, where which have more legal, you know, uh, angles and, you know, you need some someone to be able to understand the law and, you know, and understand what well, more complex situation, then Cleros is not very good for that because Cleros doesn't use, you know, lawyers and it's not, um, it's not a, it's not a legal dispute resolution system. It's a system which looks a bit more, you know, like Maxime was mentioning, the amiable compositor, where, you know, it's just lay people uh, uh, doing the resolution, which this is not completely novel in the world of arbitration. You know, arbitration 
in the early days was done by peers, you know, especially in the context of the Middle Ages Lex Mercatoria, you know, merchant disputes are to be solved by merchants, not by lawyers, you know. Uh, so that was the, the, the early days of arbitration. And this is still valid in some context of arbitration. I think in commodities arbitration, they tend to use this kind of approach. So, um, but so uh, complex subjective disputes that require legal notice. So this is better for some traditional procedure, maybe done online or on Zoom, but with traditional tools. So Keros is going to address a number of, of claims that are going to be not simple or objective enough to be solved by a machine learning algorithm, but not so much so, so complex that they require some specialized, you know, complex and traditional system for, for resolution, right? In this area, I think Kleros is probably unbeatable by any other, you know, system. This is more or less the current state of the situation. Uh, I have, let me see, I have some more time. Yeah, I'm going to just tell you a bit of what are the challenges that we have now uh, at Kleros. Kleros, of course, decentralized justice as a field is very new. Kleros is just the, I would say, the pioneer in this new field. And um, though, so we have identified like four main, like, uh, challenges to, to overcome in order for the centralized justice to become um, like mainstream. The first one is, te is technical uh, and it's about, you know, how do you produce a system where, um, you know, the token holders cannot collude in order to bribe jurors or to change the rulings in this way that they prefer. So there's a number of, you know, uh, research of crypto economics that is being done by, well, for, for addressing this problem. A second um, challenge is, okay, what are the industries? Well, where what are the use cases for centralized justice? And I mentioned, you know, esports, I mentioned a few of them. So there's a lot of work to be done in identifying where this approach is going to be better and in which cases you may want to use machine learning and in which cases you may want to use like more traditional uh, methods and which business models will arise in connection to, to this um, new approach. The third, uh, and I guess you, are, you will be more interested in this, is um, so how does all this interact with traditional frameworks? You know, is this even legal? You know, this is you are just asking anonymous people to adjudicate claims, and you no, know, uh, well, uh, I don't know, is this compliant with the uh, Uncitral or you know, New York Convention framework? Well, some people say it is because in the end, people who use this system, well, they voluntarily probably, you know. Uh, chose this as a resolution method. Other says that it isn't legal because it, uh, the, the procedure in which this works is not compliant with a number of you know, uh, due process provisions that are uh, come from the New York Convention. So there is a lot of debate around that and you, you can engage in that if you, if you are so inclined. And then you, you, we have a number of you know, situations where, where there are you know, ethical questions about how ethical is this system, you know? This is basically fair, like um, Sophie Nappert, who is a, a very well-known arbitrator in London, she always, uh, you know, she keeps asking, you know, well, is, is this fair? You know, uh, like you're basically one of the main tenets of arbitration, as we know it, is that um, arbitrators, they don't have a uh, stake, you know, they don't have skin in the game in the dispute. They, they are a neutral party who, in the end, they don't care who wins or loses. They're going to just see the facts and and decide who should win. But you know, it's not that they're going to make or not make more money by one party winning. And in Kleros, as the incentive system, because of how it works, you know, yeah, jurors, you know, arbitrators do have skin in the game in the process. And this can conflict the number of ideas we have about how an arbitration procedure should be uh, developed. If you are interested in, uh, studying all these questions. So we have a fellowship program uh, where we have different people we accept for studying whatever they feel like studying regarding Kleros and centralized justice. And we have a quite a growing community in India. You know, uh, our first uh, fellow from India is uh, Abir Sharma. He's, uh, um, he's from India, but he, is, uh, he went into Queen Mary University in London and now he's in Hong Kong doing his PhD. He researched originally, you know, oil and gas disputes. And then he did another research about Kleros for domain names. You know, you can use Kleros jurors for domain names claims. So this is one of our India members. Then we have Sandeep, who was 
looking into yeah like you know you have this new trend of um you know um digital nomads and they have agreements with companies from different countries i know this is a whole mess for labor laws and you should have if there is a claim or a dispute between a digital nomad and a company uh, in a you know a digital and a decentralized company then you should have some decentralized procedure to solve this another interesting um, use case Shradra is um, a student from uh, Columbia University doing her LLM and she's uh, researching uh, how Kleros interacts with the context of traditional arbitration as we were mentioning you know New York Convention and Kleros and all that um, then you have Viraj uh, who uh, is uh, interested in understanding the, how new business models in business to business applications of, of Kleros may arise um, and finally Sahil uh, he's uh, studying how you could use Kleros for some construction dispute uh, in India which seems to be a very important as he mentions it seems to be a very important you know type of claims that are very common there and so he wants to see if there might be some way to use Kleros in this type of, of situation so if you want to learn more about Kleros feel free to read our book. We have a book called Dispute Revolution. You can download it at kleros.io and then you have all of, well, I just explained very fast and poorly. You can just read it in this book. Then you can, if you want, uh, get involved. You can basically join the community Telegram. You have uh, interact with all of the members of the, of the team and members of the community. Lots of them are lawyers. Lots of them are arbitration lawyers. Well, there's a bit of everything. Um, so just to finalize, um, decentralized justice is this new new concept uh, which involves you know uh, arbitration blockchain and it's built on three things now right there are three main features as I mentioned blockchain because this makes sure that the process is is transparent and uh, complies with the number of procedures that gives predictability to, to parties. Second, collective intelligence you know it's based on crowds and the wisdom of the crowd to resolve disputes. And they use different innovative system for incentives in order to produce rulings which are like cheaper, faster, and yeah, and it's a better for a number of new situations that happen in the digital economy. Uh, so with that, I'm, I'm finishing. So thank you very much. I'm I'll open to your questions. Thank you so much, Federico. That was uh, fascinating, actually, very, very interesting. And I'm sure our students and other people that joined us were very happy to get into this new concept of uh, decentralized arbitration and to more, know more about Keros, since it's the most uh, famous uh, concept existing on the blockchain. Uh, we have a few questions. Um, so we have some time for the questions. Uh, the first one was from um, Azik, and he uh, mainly uh, wonders how does it work if um, because there are issues about it in India. Uh, what if, for example, a jurisdiction such as India uh, decides to ban uh, the use of, of crypto money and the reliance on uh, Keros? Um, what will happen for, uh, to such kind of disputes if this is banned uh, by India? And I guess you already have this answer for that. I guess that's more a question for you than for me. I guess, like uh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so so the, the, uh, the basic answer is we don't care because um, you have to understand that you should not envisage Keros as traditional uh, justice. It doesn't rely on any jurisdiction. So what? How can a jurisdiction impact what is happening on uh, the cyberspace? They have no mean to uh, to affect Keros. No mean to affect the users because. As you know, you, we use um, uh, crypto wallets. Uh, the identity is, uh, is not revealed on the blockchain, you're anonymous. So there is no way uh, any kind of prohibition from national courts might impact the users uh, of uh, Keros. I think, Maxi, I think Professor Avik's question is more with respect to what if that, even if the award is enforced, let's say there is an award which is enforced in the Keros system. So Avik's idea is that what if one of the party moves to one of the high court in India and challenge that decision and say that, you know, we want to challenge this because of, you know, some incentivization or because there is a, you know, blanket ban under the Indian mm -hmm. jurisdiction. So how can, so, so the challenge is based upon how can an Indian party, so the question will be, how can it, whether an Indian party can opt in to a system like Kleros and then, you know, the Indian courts, the Indian courts may have a chance 
to you know lay down a jurisprudence where they can carve out an exception or they'll ask the legislature to look into it so actually like we don't have an answer for now but it's up to the you know courts to open up you know something like clear or so like you know the indian courts are opening up with the odr platforms like now the indian courts are accepting the you know e mode of hearing so maybe there is a chance that the courts yeah. will accept but we don't know yet and yeah, we don't so my it's a, yeah it's a, it's a mystery you know um at the moment there are some you know people starting to do experiments you know yeah there is a case in mexico you know a landlord and tenant they use cleros for arbitration and the cleros decide and now there is a strategic litigation process taking place where they are taking this to court and see if a mexican court will enforce uh, a cleros ruling i you know my and there are some people who say no the court is going to say no this has no you know valid this is not invalid under our law but you know also there is the argument to be made you know this is a resolution method that was you know agreed by both parties both parties knowing how it worked and now there's also a chance that the, the court is going to say look this is uh, you have no business to do here because you agreed to use this method and if you had agreed to use to flipping a coin and deciding your problem by flipping a coin and you flip the yeah. coin uh, so there are like both arguments at, at the moment but more you know um, deeply i think i think that the question here is more about you know people tend to see cleros as a kind of adversarial and try to replace courts where whereas cleros is more as a kind of uh, more as a help and complement to court cleros is here to address disputes that courts they are not very well prepared because of cost and time considerations and because um, if cleros works it will like unclog lots of disputes that now actually go to courts and that they are very small claims and you don't want to spend a judge time into you know uh, adjudicating a very small small claim so we kind of i have but i think that the governments in the end have every incentive in order to try to use more of this type of resolution methods for the situation that these methods can better resolve hmm? yeah it's very complementary and if we think if we check at the numbers Uh, national courts don't have time to hear small claims. They are busy. Like in India, you, you know that Indian lawyers, uh, sometimes the case can take 10 years. Uh, and sometimes the amount is so low that it's not even worth uh, going to litigation. And that, this is the kind of dispute uh, Keros aims at addressing. So that's, there is a likelihood that governments will actually be inclined to accept such kind of dispute resolution process. Um, there was a second question from, uh, from Avik about um, the way uh, the, the adjudicator are appointed. And he said that uh, would be an issue, an issue that the fact that the adjudicators are not appointed by the parties. Um, if we check at existing uh, in arbitration institutions, if we go to emergency arbitration or to fast track arbitration, it, it already happens that the parties don't get to appoint the arbitrators because they agreed for that. When you go on Kleros, you agree that you will not be the one who appoints the arbitrators. So, we could consider that actually the parties completely agreed for that. And even if uh, the court will consider that uh, this is not valid, what the court will be doing? Nothing, because the seat of arbitration is on the cyberspace. And the only possibility for the court would, take, would be to take a judgment that reverse the cleverest decision. But then if the party against uh, who you were doing the arbitration cleverest is anonymous, if you only have the crypto wallet number, There is nowhere you will be yeah. able to enforce this court decision. So Sikeros as operating in a legal order which is completely detached from any existing national legal order, which means that for enforcement purpose, there is no reliance at all on national jurisdiction, which means that there will be actually um, powerless national jurisdictions which are, um, we, when we have tried to um, control decentralized arbitration. Uh, the next question was from Aditya. Uh, how is precedent, and that's actually very interesting, how is precedent maintained in a decentralized system such as Kleros, or is it completely removed? That's a really good question. And I, I didn't get time to, to, to show you how the court actually works. I have some examples I typically use in talks, but well, this was shorter. So, you know, um, the, the, each court has a number of like law that guides how jurors should um, adjudicate claims brought to that court. Um, and you know, um, you see, uh, and, and people like those law, it's not us who, who do it, you know, community members vote what should be the laws in each court. And so this is a voting governance mechanism. Um, and 
And you know, and you see that you see jurisprudence happening in real time. You know, there was a, a very, very famous case <laughs> in Cleros where you had um, uh, uh, jurors had to evaluate images. And so, and you saw how the arguments were shifting into, okay, yeah, you know, in the previous case, case, and they even cited the number, you know, in case 422, we accepted that this argument was valid for this type of uh, decision. Now, we just to keep on the same trial, we need to accept the jurisprudence and then, you know, um, and accept, make the same decision now. So, you, you every, things that happen in the legal orders, you know, traditional legal systems, uh, very slowly and very at the time where when law making happens and jurisprudence is done it happens like very fast in clear you know in matter of weeks you start having like you know small cases and you know and, and jurisprudence and people responding to that jurisprudence and criticizing that jurisprudence and, and so yeah uh, um in the end you know uh, it's it's just the um, the users or you know the jurors who decide what arguments uh, are valid or not it's not um, and you know we've seen this working i can share with you some links so you can learn a bit more about how this works but this is pretty fascinating how jurisprudence is created that's fascinating i didn't know that that in some cases they were referring to past cases um so if i understand well the cases on terrors are all public i mean we have sort of list of the cases and we can read them and see uh, what was argued on what uh, the jaw argued so that that's very natural to any legal system the the precedent is being created in that way um but also again try to uh, think out of this uh, communal perspective of the precedent uh, this applies to some jurisdictions but then we don't always need the precedent especially if we try to think of lex mercatoria there was no necessary precedent uh, but it's, it's very interesting to see how this is being developed uh, on terrors uh, we have a last question uh, from kush um, which ask, uh, do you think that there is a sense of due process um, when adjudicating the dispute and the clerus uh, system? Um, like do parties get, you know, full opportunity to present their case and stuff? They, they do, they have the opportunity to present their case, they can submit the arguments, they can submit images, uh, PDFs or whatever they need to support their case. And uh, I think once you accept the idea of having this system of incentives and all that, then, you know, uh, it works exactly as you were told it would work, you know, you, <laughs> so that's, that's a, a, a really, um, a really good thing. I mean, I, I think that, you know, in the end, what is the, what is the, the ultimate like, metric by which you would judge a system, a justice system or an arbitration system, you know, that's a really, you know, um, interesting question that and not many people have very, lots of clarity on how, what is the answer, you know, um, it's, is it, you know, um, even because there's, there's always going to be one party that loses and they're going to be a bit like uh, unhappy about losing, but you know, what is the, what is the ultimate metric, you know, even if you lost, do you understand how you lost? Are you at least uh, happy with the process? Do you understand why in this case you lost? And so if you are going to judge Claros by like um, party satisfaction of you know of how the process was done uh, I'd say that this was very successful because parties do understand how this decision was made and they still you know and you can see this on telegram you know people say yeah okay I lost this case but I understand that that other perspective uh, was also valid um, and so in this in this sense I think that um, the, the idea of due process uh, is, is, I think, captured by, by how Claros works. Yeah, and if we make the parallel with how uh, now arbitration is being conducted online, I mean, there is no nothing much different on, on Claros system. You can upload your, your different exhibits. You can even write uh, your, your arguments. You can actually upload a memo. Uh, that, that's how it works in front of arbitrators. The only thing is that we remove the, the hearing. I don't think there is any oral pleading by the parties, but this also applies in arbitration. Uh, we have a documented-based arbitration, and we still don't consider that this is a violation of due process. Um, so that's a deep question. It depends what is your conception of due process. And should we actually refer to the standard of from national jurisdiction of due process, or should we try to evolve, evolve uh, to change the notion of due process when it's about internet disputes? Um, yeah, and also there's nothing in Claros that prevents 
uh, having uh, like a hearing, you know, uh, some contract in particular could, you know, define, okay, if there's a dispute, there's going to be a hearing, which could be done over Zoom or whatever. And then um, that will produce some evidence that will be considered by, by jurors at the later point. So it's, there's nothing that, at Clero that prevents doing something like that. It hasn't been done so far, but it could be done like that as, as well. Yeah, and there was a last remark from Avic, and that's true. If your contract pertains to real assets, then it's still attached uh, to national legal orders, and usually we check uh, the Lex Loci, which is a law of the place where the goods are located. Uh, but think about in 10 years where the assets will be on the blockchain. So you won't have shares from the company, you will have tokens uh, related to an eco from the company, or wh whatever you will be trading will be tokens. For example, there, are, there is art that is being traded now on, on, the, on the blockchain. So people sell tokens that represent pictures and this is art and this values a lot of money. You see that the asset here is not a painting in the physical world, but just a mere asset. So in these situations, every good, the assets are totally located on the blockchain. And in such kind of situation, it's purely delocalized. But I agree that if it's linked to physical assets in the real world, and uh, then, yeah, yeah, there is still some connections with uh, national legal orders. That's a really interesting, you know, question. And actually, we, we have now a, a joint um, research program with the Maker Foundation that they make the MakerDAO currency in order to see how you could use Kleros in situations where these are real world assets. And, um, and you know, uh, this is a huge, huge area of interest. And because, yeah, some maybe some tokens or some some uh, like stock from companies could become fully tokens right but in some situations you know those tokens will still represent um, you know a real estate property so this i have this token and this token represents uh, ownership on a house in argentina and now i sell this or whatever and in the end if you maxim have the token you in the end you you have a token that represents my house but that token value will only, in the end depend if you could get you know an Argentine court to enforce your property rights on my house in Argentina and so in which situations this would be relevant for situations where you know um, the, the, the there is not a full detachment in the sense of you know there is a collateral that is under a government jurisdiction uh, so this is a research uh, program we are doing and um, and this is going to be if you if you are lawyers and you are securities lawyers and you want to have a, a very good idea for a career in the future and you're in the early stages so explore you know the the real world assets and tokenization inter interfaces because that's a lot of where the action is going to to happen in the years to come yeah that's going to be huge like there will be a lot of work about the interactions between uh, the blockchain legal order and the uh, national legal orders that's for sure um, okay, well, I see we run out of time. Thank you, thank you so much, Federico, for coming. I'm sure all our students were very happy to have, to have you in our class at General Global Law School. Um, hopefully in, in, in next year or maybe in, in, in a few more time, we'll be able to invite you physically on the campus and to host you at, I love uh, that. in I Sonibat love that. in yeah. India. That would be amazing. Um, so thank you everyone for coming to our conference and uh, thank you again, Federico, for this uh, brilliant lecture. And we will all um, try to follow the evolution of Kleros uh, in the next uh, months and years, hopefully. So thank you very much and uh, have a good evening, everyone, because I understand it's quite late in India. <laughs> See you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you Bye -bye, very much. Guys, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.